Today, we are going to talk about and start working on a landscape. Now, I'm going to be drawing the landscape and you'll draw along with me on your sheet of paper. So I'd like you to get out a sheet of paper that is regular printer size and make sure it's landscape position, which means that it's longer on the bottom and shorter on the sides, just like mine is, this white paper I've got. These pictures I'm showing you at first aren't what we're drawing. I'm going to use them, however, to teach you some important things or hopefully just remind you of some important things about landscapes. Now, the very first thing is that landscapes come with three sections. There are three key sections in every landscape, and that is your foreground. That's foreground, F-O-R-E, as in the prefix that means before. Your middle ground. and finally your background. And there are some basic rules to knowing the difference between these three parts and where they are. The things that are in the foreground are usually lowest. They're usually biggest. And they are closest to the viewer. Now, the fact that they are closest, that is actually true of a foreground in a landscape. Lowest and biggest, those are visual tricks that our mind uses to inform where things are. So closest, again, is actually real. Lowest and biggest is how they look in our art. I'll explain that a little bit more. The, we're gonna skip middle ground for now. The background, uh, the things typically are the highest on the page. They're often the smallest, and that is something that I'll be discussing because that's not always true. And they are, in reality, the farthest away. Now for your middle ground, of course, that means things that are going to be in the middle, in the middle of the page, in the middle of the size, and in the middle of as far as distance. So let's talk about how that works in a photo of a landscape. We have here a photo of, I believe this is the either the Great Salt Lake or the Utah Lake, but we're gonna say, I think it's Utah Lake, but we're, so Utah Lake, we have our, for our foreground, the things that are closest is these plants, this grass. It is closest, it is lowest on the page, it is closest to us as a viewer. If I was standing there, I might be able to even touch these plants. And it's biggest. Now that is completely true here. These leaves, these reeds look like they're bigger than the lake, look like they're bigger than the mountains. And of course we know in reality, they aren't. Now the mountains are going to be our background. And you can see, as we discussed, they are what's highest on the page. They are what's smallest on the page. These mountains are smaller than the lake and the reeds. And in reality, we know that they're farthest away. It would take a long time to walk to those mountains. You'd have to go around the lake, through the reeds. So that leaves the lake itself as our middle ground. So this one follows the rules pretty much perfectly. For that, I'm grateful. But that's not usually the case. So let's take a look at another example. Here we have a mountain lake. And in the mountain lake, uh, we have our foreground, once again, is lowest on the page. It's these leaves and these trees. It is what's closest to us. If I was physically there, I could go and reach the leaves and trees. And it is biggest. We see that these mountain uh, these, excuse me, the trees look visually like they're as tall as a mountain, but we know that's not the truth, right? We know that this tree is significantly smaller than the mountain that it's in front of in reality, but in the picture, it looks bigger. Our middle ground, once again, is this lake, and our background, once again, is the mountains. This one is interesting because we have more than just middle ground, foreground, and background. We have 
there's not really a word that I use, um, but you could call it like a super background. We have these mountains that I've done in red, and then this mountain that I'm gonna outline in pink is even farther back than the other mountains. It's smaller, when in reality, it's probably bigger than the mountains I outlined in red. Now this page also shows us our first breaking of the rule, the rule that the foreground is the lowest thing on the page. Yes, it starts on the bottom, that's true, but the foreground comes all the way up here to the top because this object breaks past the lines. That is visually very interesting and it's um, still the foreground. Similarly, this mountain is way lower than the other mountains, even though it's farthest back. So that instance of things being the highest on the page and the lowest on the page doesn't always apply. It applies, but you still need to know the basic rule before you break it. You always need to know the basic rule before you break it. Oh, our next picture has another landscape, and I like this one because it has our foreground, our background, our middle ground, but they're at an angle. The foreground, which is the springtime flowers, are at an angle, including the tree. The tree is also at an angle. It's still part of the foreground. And the flowers are the lowest on the page. Our middle ground, which is uh, the temple, is significantly higher. And it's also at an angle. This is at a variety of angles because it's a geometric object, but it's at an angle, you know, because the spires don't match up. And our background, the clouds are not the, um, they're not the, they are the highest thing on the page. So we've got that high, middle, low going on, even though things are at an angle. And that is very important and very visually important to show us where things are. That placement, high, middle, low, is a really good trick for you, especially as a beginning artist, to show people where they're going to find things. The next one, same kind of idea, so I'm just going to quickly show you. We have our foreground here with the rocks, our middle ground here again with the lake, and our background here with the mountains. And once again, we have two layers of mountains, mountains that are closer and mountains that are farther. And I want to take this time to talk about that. One thing I didn't mention, and I should have, so I'm going to add it to our details. The foreground things are lowest, biggest, closest, and they're also in the finest detail. The background things are highest, smallest, farthest, and they're usually blurry sometimes in color as well as detail. So we've got these rocks that are really nice and detailed. And as you go farther back in the picture, these rocks, this um, first layer of background, again, finely detailed. I'm drawing on the wrong layer. Finely, not fine as, not as fine detailed as these rocks. Like I can't see all of the cracks in this close mountain as I can in this close rock. But compare that to the amount of detail you can see in these mountains, it's almost nothing. And that is true of what your eyes see and absolutely true of what we can use as illustrators and artists in nature. Okay, now this Salt Lake is um, showing you one of the times when having that variation is important because this picture follows the rules almost as if it was the one teaching. You have your foreground, which is these trees, and the middle ground above it, which is the skyline. And then you have the background behind it, which is the mountains and the clouds. And they very much go bottom, middle, whoa, sorry, top, middle, bottom, but it's not as visually interesting as if you were to have something breaking that, like a tree. So that's just a good point in showing how things kind of break down. Our next one that I want to show you, yes, this one shows something called atmospheric perspective. That is a very important term. At 
atmospheric perspective. And this is something amazing that you can see in real life, not just in photographs. Atmosphere, of course, you know that word. Um, atmospheric perspective is the idea that as things get farther away, they become blurrier, not just in detail, but also in color. That's because the way our world looks, our sky is blue, right? Because of the way the light shifts. And if you're looking at something nearby, you have like, here's our mountain range, okay? Is on the turning world. Here's the earth, woohoo! If you're standing right here and you're looking at this mountain, you're looking through a specific amount of atmosphere, this much atmosphere. But if you're looking farther away at this mountain, you're looking through it at this much atmosphere. It works the same way the other direction too, this much atmosphere compared to this much atmosphere. That's a lot of blue sky to look through. And so because of that, Things that are very far away become lighter, clearer, a little bit more blue. So the same thing happens in our reality, in our pictures. We have our foreground of this guy, which is the trees and the hills. We have our middle ground, which is our city. And we have our background, which is our mountains. And take a look how blurry these mountains are. Look how little detail you can see. And it's a lighter color as well. We know that in reality, these mountains are like browns and grit and uh, browns and greens. But when I use my color picker tool, I'm getting gray. I'm gonna pick over here, gray. I'm gonna pick over here, gray. I'm gonna pick over here, gray. Even this part that looks really red, what is it? Reddish gray. That's, um, and it has an artist, it looks even better to make it a little bit blue. So that is really cool. That's atmospheric perspective. I just drew on the wrong thing. And now we're going to see the picture that we're actually going to draw. I'm going to be breaking this video up into two parts, um, especially because I had such a long intro. So in this first part, we'll be putting in our basic foreground, middle ground, and background. That way you can pick up on another day as well. So this here is our picture that we're going with. It's a view of Salt Lake, and I picked this one because it has these flowers in the foreground. I'm actually going to um, make them uh, bolder and more clear. I'm gonna be moving it Oh, and we're going to crop this picture as well so that it fits better on everybody's paper. Get rid of this side. Goodbye. Now it'll fit on everyone's paper. So I'm going to be putting it over here off to the side. The white section of my page is where you're going to be drawing. And the gray section is where I'm going to hold all of our reminders. The photo and the mentions of the three sections and what they do. That all won't all fit, so I will just move these down below. Okay, so I hope during this time you're getting your supplies ready, your pencil and everything. Oh, whoops, okay. So I've got my pencil. I'm using a pencil tool that is going to look similar to as if I was drawing with a mechanical pencil. You can of course use a wooden pencil as well. Um, they're even better, but I'm gonna use mine because it has a nice fine tip. So we're going to start, okay, I understand, please stop. We're going to start with our basic shapes. Now with our picture, we want to make sure that we have things about spaced out correctly. We have how tall our mountains are. And so I just wanna put in these basic lines for the foreground, middle ground, and background. Our mountains are about 
one fifth of the way down. So I'm just going to put this fine little line right along the top. And then they come down as well. If you can see in our painted, our photo, the photo, the mountains come back down another fifth of the way. So I'm going to put another line there. They're very thin, they're very light, because I don't want them dark, especially for you guys where it's going to be hard to erase something that's light. And these are just guidelines. The city skyline is less than halfway through the page, so I'm going to go ahead and make my line less than halfway. And the trees are right at that bottom fifth. Here's my guideline for that. And I'm not putting in a guideline for my flowers because I'm going to do that last. Now that I have my basic guidelines, I'm going to shrink this picture one more time so that it's not interrupting things. Okay, that's good. And I can put in my outlines themselves. So let's start with our mountains. I zoomed in a little tiny bit too much. Okay. So our mountains come up just a bit and back down. And you'll notice I'm staying up high as I draw the mountains. I'm just doing the visual outline. Something that I'm going to do is make a rudimentary grid over my picture. I have talked to you guys over and over about gridding. That's because I believe it's super important. That's why I put in those lines where the skyline is, where the trees are. I was basically doing a simple grid. And now that I've started working on mine, I want to do the same thing. If you have found as an artist that you don't like the grid technique, don't do it. Just do what works for you. So now I know that I started dipping my mountain down too early. So it's still early enough that I'm going to use my eraser. If you did it right, you don't have to erase because you're amazing and better than I was. Bring it back up to the top of that grid, come down a bit, up a bit, and then slide on down. It comes part way through that grid section, over and down. And it's below that middle line, that middle line that is right here. I didn't extend it all the way, and so that may have confused some of you watching. So now I know if I'm following my grid space, I'm right here. So I'm going to keep going, connect to this side, and now the angle down is a little less steep. It goes up, over, and up to the top, down, up, over. All right, and I need to do one more thing with my grid. See, guys, this is why you shouldn't start gridding and then stop gridding. It's a bad idea. Okay, now I've got the basic outline of my mountains in. And this is what I'm going with. However, as you can see, the mountains have a second layer that's closer. They actually have lots of mountainous details. But this mountain right here is in front of the rest of it. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that in, putting my grid back on so I can see it better. And I'm going to draw that mountain starting at the top, this blue little line on my grid. I'm going to bring it down to the other grid, almost to the edge. And see, I got that line wrong. Good thing I have an eraser. It comes over to the top. 
and down. Now, the thing about drawing mountains is that they have so many of these little details that like to get in the way and get on top of what you're trying to draw. I'm stopping here because this is where the mountain hits the building. All of these tiny little details. What you need to do as an artist is figure out which lines create the biggest shapes. So I chose the outline because that definitely creates the biggest shape. And then I chose this line because that creates the next biggest shape. As I go in, probably in the next video and put in more lines, I'll be going along the other mountain ridges first before I start putting in these shadow shapes. Those would be next. Again, biggest shapes first. Okay, so back to our drawing. Now that we've got our mountain sketched in, now I'm going to start sketching in the buildings. So I have quite a few buildings on this picture. I'm going to go ahead and move my reference picture over so I can see it better. We're going to put it here in the cloud space. And I'm going to move my grid as well. Does that line up? There we go. Scooch it over. Perfect. Okay. There. Okay. So I've got my mount, my buildings to sketch in. Now the most of the buildings line up with this blue line. Is it perfect? No, because I didn't use a ruler and I didn't measure. If you want to use a ruler and measure, you're amazing. Go ahead. I know that this first rectangular building comes almost to the edge, comes down about halfway before it hits this building with a round top. I'm gonna curve up that round top. And once again, I am, oh, sorry, had to sneeze. I am just drawing the outlines of the buildings, just like I did with drawing the outlines of the mountains. The round building comes down, it hits the edge of the temple which comes down then I move down here to where my tree line is then we have a little bit of space before our next building starts which shoots up at an almost straight line we have a trapezoidal roof not quite hitting the blue line going across to the next grid section coming down and down again and the next one is almost touching that goes Above the blue line, this office building has a flat top. And then it comes back down all the way to the tree line. We have some little buildings down here, so I'm going to put in some small gestures, some small boxes. And then we have another office building, the yellow one, that comes up past the blue line and it stair steps its way above the blue office building, stretches across, comes down, stair steps its way down, back down to the trees. And then we have a building that has a straight line before it has a triangular roof. That comes back down. We have some buildings that are obstructed by the flower, but we're going to draw them in because our flower will be fine details on top. And then one last building that comes up to our grid line comes across and stops. Oh, and our grid line changed. Mrs. Hendricks made a mistake with her grid line. Do you see I've got two grid lines? I'll clean that up before the next video starts. Okay, we've got our buildings gestured in. The last thing I want to do before our time is up for this video and for today, I want to gesture in these treetops. I'm not going to get all the fine details of the building in this video. And honestly, that's all going to be optional as well. We're only putting in one hour of, of drawing together. Anything else you want to do is extra. So I'm going to put in these treetops by 
doing these gestury, bushy lines. Here's an interesting tip about doing a landscape. And this is true as a professional. Nature changes. Nature shifts. If you take a picture of a tree and then you go and look at that exact same tree the next day, even though the tree won't have changed a lot, because of wind, the leaves will be in a different place. And if you go and look at it a year later, the tree will be very different. However, is the same true of a city? Sometimes buildings are built, sometimes buildings are destructed, but overall, cities stay the same. They don't change every day when the wind blows. And people are likewise more forgiving if your trees and your plants look different than they do in real life. If you still have things kind of looking the same way, they're going to be like, yeah, that looks correct. But if you draw a building wrong, people are going to be like, I go to that building. That's my office. That looks wrong. And it's not that they're trying to be rude. That's just how it is. Okay. So obviously this isn't done, but it is a nice solid start. And I'm going to stop our video so that we can pick up tomorrow from where we left off. I hope yours looks similar. Don't overwork yourself. Do your eye ready, and I'll talk to you later.